Charles Darwin and some modern scientists think that life started all on its own. It sort of just happened spontaneously. It's called chemical evolution. They say it started with chemicals forming building blocks and then combining into polymers like DNA and RNA. These previous videos detail just some of the scientific problems with that ever happening. Anyway, let's wave our little magic wand. And say all those challenges have been solved for now. We don't have life yet, but what are the next steps toward life? Well, just like eggs have a hard time turning into a chicken without a shell, and water balloons are not much fun without the balloon, living things need a cozy little house of their own to keep the good stuff in and the bad stuff out. We're talking cell membranes. All living things are made up of cells that are surrounded by a cell membrane. Life simply cannot exist without membranes. Origin of Life researchers claim that cell membranes are easy to make and that they have demonstrated this in the lab. They point toward experiments where these molecules called phospholipids are placed in water and they form into a spherical shell, kind of like a cell membrane, all on their own. Wow. But is it really the case that cell membranes are so easy to form? Let's take a look more closely. Real quick, if you're new here, Long Story Short is about explaining science in an easily digestible way. If that sounds good to you, consider sharing this video with a friend and subscribing for more. Okay, cell membranes, needed for life, supposed to be easy to make. Is that the case? Membranes do a lot of essential things to keep the cell alive. If any are missing, death results. <gasps> Think of the membrane like a house in outer space. Uh, space house, nice. Space House provides a safe, comfortable environment inside, despite things outside desperately wanting to kill you. Outside, the temperature can fluctuate between as hot as an oven and as cold as negative 455 degrees. You know, almost as cold as your ex's heart. Not to mention the radiation, lack of oxygen or water, there's a vacuum, space pirates. Inside though, there's an ample supply of pizza, tacos, warm blankies, that's what I'm talking about. The environment inside the house is controlled and very distinct from the outside. That's what keeps us alive. In a cell, the membrane is responsible for keeping things safe and comfy too. The fancy name for this is homeostasis. But walls that are sealed up tight with no way to let trash out or new food in will quickly become a stinky tomb. The cell will quickly die as food runs out and garbage piles up. The very simple membranes that scientists create in the lab are exactly like this. Non-functional, stinky tombs. Real cell membranes need to be tight, but also have very specific doors that actively let things in and out in order to maintain homeostasis. And it needs to have all of this complexity at the very beginning. There's no time for this to gradually evolve because no homeostasis, no life. What if early membranes were a bit leaky, like these papers suggest? Maybe the first cells had holes in them that were just big enough to let good things in and keep the bad stuff out, somehow finding a good balance to maintain homeostasis. Unfortunately, that won't work. All existing cell membranes need to let big things in while at the same time keeping small things out. In other words, they have conflicting requirements. All cells harness their energy by pumping protons out and very carefully letting them back in to spin these proton turbines like a hydroelectric power plant. And protons are teensy tiny. To give you a sense of scale, if a proton were the size of a housefly, then a bit that the cell would need to let in, like this amino acid histidine, would be roughly the size of the country of Monaco. And the smallest known cells would be roughly Sweden sized. Those are the approximate scales that we're working with. Basically, Sweden would need to keep houseflies out while at the same time letting the Monaco-sized things in. If the membrane let too many fly-sized protons slip in, the cell would die. So the membrane has to be tight enough to not let these teensy-weensy protons in, but also porous enough to be able to let these relatively gigantic things come right on in. These conflicting requirements of the membrane are a real head-scratcher. Fun fact, at any given time, a cell is generating roughly the same voltage per meter across its membrane as a bolt of lightning. 
Another conflicting requirement is that cells have to let water in, but if water was just allowed to pour in willy-nilly, so would those sneaky tiny little protons, and this would drain the cell's battery, so to speak, and the cell would, again, die. Thankfully, cells have specialized doors called aquaporins. They work sort of like an airlock in our space house by safely letting things in without destroying the nice environment inside. The aquaporin lets water molecules in single file, but that still wouldn't be enough to stop the protons from sneaking in and killing the cell, because the water acts sort of like a wire, conducting the protons along itself. So the aquaporin also rotates each water molecule by 90 degrees, flipping them around and eliminating its ability to conduct protons for just long enough to safely let the water inside. Every cell has tons of these incredibly specialized doors. The simplest known free-living life form is a single-celled guy called Mycoplasma genitalium, but it has thousands of specialized doors composed of over a hundred different proteins that operate within the cell membrane. So even the simplest cell has an extraordinarily complex membrane an active, selectively permeable boundary that allows and often forces exactly the right things in and out to maintain homeostasis, a perfect environment inside the cell, despite wildly varying conditions outside. Leaky membranes and tight membranes would both kill the cell. The membrane had to be extremely complex from the very beginning, or life could never begin. Well, yeah, today it's very complex, but there's been a lot of time for things to evolve. When life was just getting started, there weren't cells, there were proto-cells. They were way simpler. Okay, could life have been simpler? Scientists try to gauge what the simplest possible life form could have been by taking a very simple cell and removing as many things as possible without killing it. These papers took a very simple bacterial cell that had about 985 genes and cut it down to 474 genes. But the bug was barely hanging on, so they added a few genes back in to get a cell that was more reasonably alive. They found 493 genes were essential to keep the minimal cell alive. This work suggests that there is a practical boundary for how simple life can possibly be, not just today, but at any point in time. But in order to cut that many genes from the original 985, they essentially had to coddle the poor, hobbled little bacteria. You see, the original bacteria was able to make its own food from what was around it, like a big boy. But the downsized bacteria needed someone else to make his PB&J for him. And he was picky. He needed it cut into triangles and had a crust cut off. Dad, how many times do you have to tell It required a precise cocktail of nutrients, basically life support, or else it would die. However, most of these life support nutrients couldn't have existed on a prebiotic earth. If you try to simplify a living organism, removing some of its tools for survival, it doesn't just magically no longer need that thing. The only way to keep it alive is to place a heavier burden for survival on the surrounding environment. The organism just becomes more genetically fragile, unable to endure slight environmental changes, or it'll become dependent on other life forms to keep it alive, which, if you're paying attention, is not a possibility for the first living thing. Consider yourself. Could you live without legs? Technically, yes. But more requirements will be placed on your environment. You will need a wheelchair, ramps to go up or down, and nice smooth surfaces. Or robot leg. Can you live without kidneys? Technically, yes. But you will need to be hooked up to a sophisticated dialysis machine to do what your kidneys do three times a week for three to five hours per day for the rest of your life. The more you remove from a person to simplify them, the more requirements are placed on the environment to keep them alive. The same is true for microscopic life. These experiments don't actually do away with needed complexity, it's just exported to the environment. Real cell membranes are complex machines with many required functions, like identifying needed molecules, and opening specific doors to let them in, or force them in, identifying waste and exporting it, maintaining proper pH, salinity, and osmotic pressure, blocking toxins and dangerous invaders, providing electrical insulation, energy harnessing, and even acting as a template for expanding the membrane during replication, because cells can't actually build a membrane from scratch. They need a pre-existing membrane to do that. The lab-made membranes, on the other hand, 
do literally none of these things. They're closer to dumb soap bubbles or salad dressing than anything else. When scientific literature or textbooks claim that membranes are easy to create in the lab, it's a lot like saying the Mona Lisa is easy to draw. Or making some dinosaur-shaped chicken nuggets is equivalent to making real actual dinosaurs. There's a bit of a difference there. The observable science makes it clear that, one, because of the need for homeostasis and the conflicting requirements of cells, the membrane had to be extremely complex right from the very beginning, or life could never have begun. Claims that this problem is even close to being solved are badly misrepresenting the science. And two, attempting to simplify a living organism merely kicks the can down the road. These experiments only hide the complexity by exporting it to the environment. And a prebiotic environment was certainly not like a lab or hospital ICU. So, when you hear protocell, think leprechaun or rainbow unicorn. There is no evidence that any of these ever existed. And the more science learns about life, the more unscientific chemical evolution becomes.